So why pray when God already has a plan? That, that is a good question. I mean, if God already has a plan, if he's already articulated and expressed and inaugurated his strategic plan for the, all of eternity, why, why would I pray? How do my prayers make a difference? My way of answering this question allows me to share one of my favorite stories of all time. And it just so happens that the main character of the story is here with us today, my youngest daughter, Sarah, turning 22 today. Happy birthday, darling. <laughs> but when Sarah was seven years old, we decided to buy her a desk. Really, she wanted a desk. She wanted a desk. I wasn't like this as a kid. I didn't want a desk in my room. I wanted, when I got out of school, I didn't want anything to do with school. But my daughters uh, would come home from school and then play school. I don't know if you ever get over that or not. But they, they, and so she wanted a desk. That's a fair request of a father and a mother. So we decided, okay, let's go get her a desk. And so on a Saturday, we went to a store here in San Antonio that does the oddest things. It sells unpainted furniture. Have you ever heard of these stores? This one's called Furniture in the Raw. I was a little embarrassed just by the name of it, but <laughs> Furniture in the Raw. And so you go and you pick out. Now, I don't know why a person wants furniture that hasn't been painted, but that's what Dean Lynn liked. And so we did. We went and we got, uh, so we went to pick out a desk. Now, the, 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 the issue is we picked out the desk and if we had told Sarah, uh, she didn't understand us, so I don't know, but somewhere there was a miscommunication, and she didn't know that we weren't going to be taking the desk home that day because you pick it out, and then you pick out the way you want it to be painted, and unless you're painting it yourself, you leave it there to be painted, and then it's delivered, you know, three, four weeks later. Well, that takes forever if you're seven years of age. And so when we told her that the desk was not going to be delivered that day, she... Well, she wasn't very happy. To her credit, she was very respectful. And she set out on a crusade to change her father's mind. Every time I turned around, there she was telling me or asking me, Dad, can't we take it home today? I'll help you paint it. I'll pick out the paint with you. I'll help you carry it in the house. One time I turned a corner and there she was and she had her arms like this. She had been out in the parking lot looking at our Suburban and she had measured the width of the Suburban and so there was this little seven-year-old girl who said, Daddy, it fits. It fits. And of course, it melts your heart, you know? And then she said, Come on, Daddy. Daddy. That's a key word, kids, to use. <laughs> you know? So guess who went home with a desk that day? The Locato family did. Now why? Well, first of all, it was, a, it was a legitimate request. It was a legitimate request. It was a request offered with respect and kindness. And, 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 and then also it was a request of a child to a father. And then it was a request that fit within the great scope of my plan, but it just altered the details of the plan. There's a picture of powerful prayer, respectful, earnest prayer that fits within the scope of what God is wanting to accomplish on earth. You're just asking him to accelerate it, do it uh, more earnestly, perhaps in a different way. Would that prayer make a difference? It absolutely did with Moses when God determined that it was time to do something with these children of Israel who had built the golden calf and were worshiping it. He was ready to start over with another nation. But Moses went up on Mount Sinai in Exodus chapter 32 tells us how he prayed and his prayers, Scripture says, changed the mind of God. His prayers changed the mind of God. Now, I'm not quite sure how all that works. I do know there are certain things about God you and I will never change. Your prayers will not change the character of God. He will always be holy. He, he will always be endless. He will always be loving. He will always be kind. He will always be just. Your prayers will not change His character. 
nor will your prayers change his overarching plan. We like to call that the upper story, his plan of redemption, his plan to send Jesus to live on the earth, to die for us, to destroy death, and his plan to return to earth and establish a one king kingdom forever. You can pray till you're blue in the face and you're not going to change that. The overarching plan of God is established. But the details, the unfolding thereof, he invites his church, his children, to engage with him. For what reason? Maybe to teach us his heart. Maybe to unveil to us the way he works. Maybe to prepare us, because what life is, this earth is on-the-job training for our eternal assignments and maybe there's something about learning to commune and communicate with him now that will be necessary for us to know in the new kingdom. But yes, your prayers matter. So pray for rain. Pray for politicians. Pray for your children. Pray for healing. Pray for hope. Pray for revival. Pray. More is wrought on the face of the earth because of praying saints than we have, of which we have any imagination. Your prayers matter. The Bible says that the earnest prayers of a righteous man availeth much. So pray, pray earnestly. This really leads into the second question, doesn't it? And that is the question of suffering. We'll pop it up again just to make sure. I... Why does God permit suffering? It seems to me that all of us have a certain way of completing this question or sentence if God was God then or if God is God then if God is God then I'm going to have a wonderful husband if God is God I'll have good health if God is God my kids will always obey me if God is God then I'll get a good job if God is God then seldom do we articulate it but often when you talk with a person who's passing through a crisis of faith they're really dealing with unmet expectations does that make sense because if God was God why did we have this car wreck or if God was God why did the economy go in the tank or if God was God why won't it rain because we have expectations that if God is God then certain things are going to happen God didn't create those expectations. God didn't give himself that job description, but we tend to impose a job description on God. And when he doesn't do what we think a God should do, when he doesn't behave like we think a God should behave, we pass through a crisis of faith. You know the sentence, God created man in his image and then man returned the favor? We create a God in our own image. Our, if God is God, then he should do what I expect him to do. And when he doesn't, that can create a crisis of faith, especially when that's a, a severe challenge that we are given, ALS or a child that's born with health issues or poverty. It, it just, it's just really tough. So how does the scripture teach us to navigate these waters? And I'm confident, I'm absolutely confident that somebody's navigating them right now. There is a verse in the Bible that brings so much hope on this particular topic. I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Right after 1 Corinthians, which is right after Romans, which is right after Acts, which is right after the Gospels. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. These are words written by the Apostle Paul. In verse 17. He says... For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For our light affliction. Okay, what do you know about the Apostle Paul? Did he pass through any times of affliction? 
Anybody remember anything that happened to him? Did, how many of you know that he was left for dead after being stoned? How many of you know that he endured shipwrecks? That he was stranded on an island? How many of you know that he was in prison? In fact, the reason we have some of his epistles is because he had prison time. And so he wrote epistles. How many of you know that, 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 that he was basically a, kind of a vagabond all of his life and he really never had a home? He traveled from city to city preaching and building and starting churches. Okay, so when Paul is talking about light afflictions here, he's not talking about he didn't get a parking place or that his Starbucks coffee was cold. He's talking about some serious afflictions. He led a very challenging life. But he called these light afflictions. He called them light afflictions and he compared them with the eternal weight of glory. Eternal weight of glory. So look at this language. Light, not very heavy. Weight of glory, very heavy. I wonder if he was thinking in terms of a pan scale. You ever seen one of these? This one came from Guatemala. It belongs to our friend, Minister Pat Heil, who lived in Guatemala for many years. And you know how they work. If you want to weigh something, you want to weigh how much you know flour you have. You put the flour over here, and you put the weights over here, and you can, when they balance out, you have an idea how much they weigh. Now you don't know this, but there's something already in one of these pans. But because the weight of it is so light, it doesn't cause that pan to dip or look heavy. You know what it is? It's this morning's Cheerio. This morning's Cheerio. How much do you think a Cheerio weighs? Boy, it didn't do much, did it? Didn't do much. This is light. It's not very heavy. It doesn't have much density. It doesn't weigh anything down. Paul says, all these afflictions I've gone through, well, I'm going to call them light. Here's a double Cheerio. Ooh, still not very heavy. That's not very heavy. Compared to something that has weight. And what is it that has weight? Here are some weights. These are weights. He says, compared to the eternal and exceeding weight of glory. In other words, compared to what we're going to experience in heaven... Over here doesn't even have any weight. Here's what has weight. Whoa! <laughs> I think Paul wanted that kind of response. Now when you think about heaven in comparison to earth, it's not that there is no weight at all in the difficulties that you're facing. It's just that when you compare them to what awaits you for all of eternity, it's light, and Paul says it's here but for a moment. It's brief. It doesn't last that long. When you compare what awaits you in a graveless, sinless eternity to what you're going through right now, I'm thinking this verse says someday you may look back on what today is a very heavy struggle, and you may from heaven look back and say, can somebody help me remember? What was that disease I had? Somebody remember? I just remember having some hard days, but I can't remember what was bothering me. Because you will have entered into an eternal kingdom that is so spectacular in a purified society, in a perfect body, in which all of the questions will be answered and you will serve in a perfect body with a perfect mind, a perfect Savior, in a perfect society. And you will say, oh, okay, that was to prepare me for heaven. That's Paul's point. All of these light and momentary afflictions are preparing us for an eternal weight of glory, exceeding weight of glory. Somehow what you're going through now on earth is equipping you for your eternal life. Let me say it again. This life is not about this life. This life is not about this life. And if you think it is, you're going to be very disappointed in God. Aren't you? Because sometimes this life stinks. 
You say, God, why can't you fix all this? He will. He will. But this life is equipping you for the next life. It is on-the-job training, equipping you for your role in the next life. So you pray, so you trust, so you lean. You don't give up, and you know that it's all going to work out in the way God planned. I think we have another question. This time it's from face, Facebook. Facebook. Can I confess that I've never been on Facebook in my life? Okay, I just confessed it. But some of you have, and you picked this question. Where do I turn when anxiety is affecting my life? Okay, if, that, if you don't have any anxieties, go ahead and take a nap. The rest of us are going to spend five minutes before we're finished talking about worry, talking about anxiety. Anxiety is when you let tomorrow take today's joy. Anxiety is when you let tomorrow write a check on today's joy. Have you ever done that? The Bible is all about planning about being prepared. I don't think the Bible is anti-health insurance, anti-savings accounts. I think that's responsible living. But I do believe the Bible is about, is anti-writing a check on today's joy because of tomorrow's problems, because of problems that really aren't even here yet. Here, here's, here's the word in the Bible for worry. M-E-R-I-M-N-A-O. And it comes from, it's a compound word that comes from the verb marizo, which means to split or divide uh, in the noun noose, which means mind so worry means to split or divide your mind does that make sense in what way does worry divide your mind in what way would worry divide your mind well it takes today's energy and it begins spending it on tomorrow's problems it takes today's focus and it exports it into tomorrow's issues. It takes today's capacity and it begins writing checks on needs that have yet to surface. That's why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6 and verse 34, you cannot add any time to your... I'm sorry, this is Matthew 6, 27. You cannot add any time to your life by worrying about it. Worry does not make a difference. Worry does not change the challenges. Have you found that worry really does help? How many of you have it at the end of the day said, boy, this was a great day because I worried all the way through it? I don't know what I would have done today if I hadn't have been so anxious. I feel so much better this morning because I stayed awake all night. How many of you feel like worry really helps your day? We know it doesn't. The truth is it contributes to bad health. It causes stomach issues, migraines, creates heart disorders. It really wages war on our physical health and much more our spiritual health and then our relationships. Nobody likes being married to, raised by, parented by attached to a worrier. It's rough. So what can you do about it? The Bible gives you two practical instructions. Number one, trust the generosity of God. Trust the generosity of God. At its root, worry is the fear we will run out. It is the fear we will exhaust our supplies. It's the fear that I'm going to run out of energy, run out of patience. I won't have what I need when I need it. It's the fear that I just am going to exhaust everything. King David said in the 23rd Psalm, my cup overflows. He discovered a Jehovah who kept his cup overflowing. His goblet wasn't big enough to hold all the wine and the kindness and the mercy and the generosity. So you, if you can shift your attention away from what you lack 
and begin focusing on how generous God is, He is the cheerful giver who gives all. If you can turn your attention toward that. And then number two, if you can, this is really important. If you can learn that God will give you what you need when you need it. God will give you what you need, but not until you need it. But he will give it when you need it. Hebrews says that we can approach the throne of grace where we shall find mercy and help in the hour of our need. You and I would like to get all of our help right now long before we need it, just so we know we'll have it when we need it, right? But God doesn't work that way. He meets daily needs daily. This teaches us to trust Him and to listen to Him. Yesterday, my wife, Deanlin, and I spent our day driving to Waco and back to pick up a new puppy. In fact, I'd like to show you the new Locato family member. <laughs> this is Andy, the source of future sermon illustrations. <laughs> Andy's only three months old. The reason we have Andy is because Molly, our golden retriever, died last January. And, and Deanlin and uh, Sarah had been swapping uh, pictures uh, about Andy because initially, Sarah, who I told you about earlier, who lives in Waco, wanted Andy. She found him in, a, um, fuzzy, in the Fuzzy Friends uh, dog shelter. You know, where people take dogs and they, people who want dogs can come and find them. It's kind of like a dog orphanage. So we went, uh, she found uh, uh, Andy there only to be told by her landlord that no dogs are allowed. Hmm. She'd already fallen in love with Andy. And unbeknownst to me, so had my wife just through pictures. So Deanlin told me on Friday, we're going to Waco. She said, I'm going to Waco tomorrow to get a dog. I said, well, I'm not going to let you go by yourself. So I went with her. So we went and got a dog. I tell you that story because when we reached Waco, we didn't know where the Fuzzy Friends Refuge dog orphanage was. And so... <laughs> We, did you know that you can enter an address on your iPhone and a little map will pop up and give you instructions? Did you already know this? It's a wonderful thing to do. And so I was in the passenger seat. She was behind the wheel. And so I had the iPhone and I took the address and I entered it into the iPhone. And all of a sudden I had this great itinerary that had this little blue dot floating us up I-35 and directing where we were going to go. It would even give you little written instructions. 1.9 miles, turn right at Hildebrand, 2.3 miles. If you wanted to, you could see the whole thing. I could see the next turn. So I told Deanlin, I said, Honey, whenever it's time for us to make the next turn, I will tell you. <laughs> and not before. So when we get to the intersection, you don't need to worry about anything. You just drive the car. Drive the car. Don't worry about anything. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the left. Don't look back. You just keep looking forward. And you know that just a few moments before it's time to turn, you'll hear me say, okay, turn right at the next intersection. She did not like that. <laughs> she did not like that. She wanted to know the whole itinerary before she, she wanted to know, okay, in two miles, you're going to be turning left. She wanted to know. I said, honey, this is an exercise in faith. <laughs> this is how God leads us. She said, you're not God. <laughs> she didn't like that. And guess what? Neither do you. Right? You and I, don't we want to know the next 20 years? If God would tell you right now the play-by-play, -play, the itinerary of the next 25 years of your life, would you want it? Would you think now? Would you? Do you really want to know? That's a good question, isn't it? I think God knows it would overwhelm us. I think... God knows 
it would overwhelm us, that we simply would not have the capacity. You mean there's a car accident in our future? You mean the economy's not going to get better for that long? You mean, you, you, you hear what I'm saying? It might just be overwhelming. Could it be? Okay, here's just a crazy thought. But could it be that you have not a God, but you have an Abba Father, a Daddy, who reveals to you what you need, when you need it, because He knows how much your mind can take? Could it be that for your own good, He says, Hey, don't worry. Don't look to the right. Don't look to the back, left. Don't look back. You just keep your eye on the road. And at the time you need it, I will give you what you need. Don't worry. This is exactly what Jesus said in Matthew, again, chapter 6. This time I'm reading from a translation that's called The Message. Jesus said, give your entire attention to what God is doing right now. Don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up when the time comes he will help you when the time comes a young person says I don't know if I'll have the wisdom or intelligence to go to college well maybe you don't right now but you will when the time comes the single person says I don't know if I have the patience or the faithfulness to be a good spouse well maybe you don't right now but you will when the time comes that young couple says I don't know if we have the what it takes to be parents well you're not parents yet but God when the time comes will give that to you I don't know if I have what it takes to face old age or to face disease or to face a calamity well maybe you don't right now but at that moment he will give you what you need for now don't look to the right don't look to the left don't look back you just keep your eye on the road don't behave like my wife did <laughs> just keep your eye on the road and trust he will give you what you need when you need it can I go home with you today for lunch <laughs>